Have you had your 15 minutes of fame? You've heard the reference before, haven't you? There's an ordinary, everyday person doing ordinary, everyday jobs, attending school, taking care of the family, doing all of the things that we associate with everyday, ordinary life, and then something extraordinary happens, fame is thrust upon them, and for a time they are in the limelight of local, national, or the global media. Their picture and story are everywhere. They're getting what we refer to as their 15 minutes of fame. There's a fire at a house. A man is driving down the road. He sees the fire as it's beginning to build. He goes to the house and breaks in and gets the people who are inside out to safety. That night, you see his story on the news, 15 minutes of fame. There is a child in the big city near the subway who's beginning to wander close to the tracks as a train is approaching and a lady nearby runs and grabs the child and pulls him away right before he steps in front of that train and her story is on the news. She gets her 15 minutes of fame. Sometimes it's not an heroic thing. Many years ago, there was a story of a lady, I'd never forgot it, she was shopping in the grocery store, and the last time she had bought grapes there, they were a little bitter. So this time, before buying the grapes, she reached out and grabbed just one and put it in her mouth to taste it. And they called the police, she was arrested and booked and put in prison overnight, but she got her 15 minutes of fame because I saw the story as she sat with Jay Leno on The Tonight Show and told everyone what had happened to her. We enjoy hearing stories like this. The hometown girls softball league goes to the national championship. We give them their 15 minutes of fame. A community leader finds herself on national television and she gets her 15 minutes of fame. A movie is produced in the city of Richmond and someone we know gets to be an extra and have a screenshot and they get their 15 minutes of fame. But sometimes it's not 15 minutes. Sometimes it's nothing but 15 seconds. It comes and goes so quickly that nobody even notices. It even happens in ministry. 15 seconds of fame. Nobody notices. That's what happens in the text today. It took about 15 seconds to read that section. It is the story of Matthias, called to be apostle number 12, called to replace Judas Iscariot, who had betrayed Jesus and turned him over to the police. The disciples have become stuck, as it were, between Ascension and Pentecost. Jesus had left them instructions. It was simple. Don't do anything, just wait. Don't act on your own. Wait for the Holy Spirit to act. Sometimes the command of Scripture is not, don't just stand there, do something. Sometimes it's, don't just do something, stand there. Stand there and wait for the Holy Spirit to come and empower you and guide you and instruct you. But evidently the early church was not good at waiting. Few of us are. They felt the need to be busy for the sake of busyness sake. There had to be something they could do. And replacing Judas seemed like the logical, reasonable, and rational thing. And so in order to discern God's will, get this, they cast lots or they tossed the dice. And Matthias was selected and certified and accepted and in the blink of an eye, in less than 15 seconds, he became apostle number 12. Now with a call story like this, we wonder why he's not up there with Abraham in the angelic visitation or Moses and the burning bush or Samuel and the mysterious voice and Paul with the blinding light. But Matthias doesn't get that kind of attention. He doesn't have that sort of notoriety. He doesn't even get 15 minutes of fame. He barely gets 15 seconds. You might say he was the Rodney Dangerfield of discipleship. No respect, I tell you. No respect. In fact, he's not mentioned again anywhere in the New Testament. He's not mentioned again anywhere in the annals of church history. 
We remember the big names who make it onto the big screen. We remember the surround sound and the technicolor brilliance and the digital effects. We know the story of Abraham and Moses and David and James and John and Peter and Paul. But what of Messiahs? Barely 15 seconds. Not even enough for a small black and white TV late in the evening when nothing else is on. He's not even a flash in the pan. Just a couple of lines of text and he's done. Do you ever wonder if Matthias wanted to have his big screen calling? Do you ever wonder if he wanted to have the attention? Not in an ego-driven sort of way, but simply because he wanted to make a difference for the kingdom of God. He wanted to stand shoulder to shoulder with James and John and Peter and the rest. He wanted to stand shoulder to shoulder and be strong and confirm that the call that he had received was actually from God. Moses had his burning bush. Mary had the angelic visitation late at night. Wouldn't you like to have, don't you think Matthias wanted to have that clear vision with specific instructions? The audible voice coming from the heavens, the still, small, yet audibly clear whisper that comes in the middle of the night. I'd love to have that kind of clarity, wouldn't you? I would love to have the meaningful, positive 15 minutes of fame. But God doesn't call us all to the same avenues of service, and God calls even fewer in such a dramatic fashion. So does that mean that the calling that comes like that from Matthias is less valid? I don't think so. Does that mean that the ministry that we're called to is less significant than that of the person who can fill out the stadium or the auditorium? I don't think so. Matthias was called to be apostle number 12. He was called by what amounted to the early church's nominating committee. They called him to fill a slot for the list of the officers for the time that was ahead. And here's the reality check. Most of us are called in this simple way. But an ordinary call does not excuse inactivity and passivity. You know what I mean. We'd love to serve like that, we say, when the nominating committee comes knocking on the door. But God has not spoken to me. You should never do what God calls you. You should never do what God has not called you to do. But you should never excuse the ordinary calling as an excuse for doing nothing. I've heard people reject God's call by saying, I have not had the clear vision. I haven't heard the audible voice. I haven't seen the burning bush. In other words, what they're saying is, I want the great big dramatic encounter with God calling me to some avenue of service. Further, I have heard people reject the call of God because it was considered too humdrum for their level of passion that they wanted to have that ministry that received notoriety and honor and glory. They don't want 15 seconds of fame. 15 seconds is not enough. At least 15 minutes or they're out the door. I'd love to teach Sunday school, but I haven't seen the burning bush. I'd love to help out with the Micah project, but God has not called me through an angelic visitation. I'd be willing to serve wherever God wants me to be, but I just want to hear the voice of God call. The big technicolor, audible surround sound voice. The pyrotechnics with all of the special effects. Do you think Matthias wanted that kind of vision? painting him in the best light possible, and there's no reason not to. He probably wanted the dramatic call and the big affirmation. But God called him in very ordinary ways. But he was still called to the extraordinary work of the kingdom. So maybe he had the credentials. He'd been to seminary. He was a great public orator. He was a man known for his business acumen. He was an extremely positive and gifted leader. None of that stuff is mentioned in the text either. There's no qualifications that are given. We place qualifications on people. We disqualify ourselves or others because the credentials just don't seem to be there. 
Well, what was Matthias' traits and qualifications? The Bible doesn't mention any. We don't know anything about his education. We don't know anything about his experiment, experience. We don't know anything about his achievements. We don't know anything about his level of spiritual giftedness. The text tells us just one thing. It gives us just one qualification. Matthias had been with Jesus. That's it. That's all that's mentioned. He had walked with Jesus. He had listened to Jesus, learned from Jesus, trusted Jesus. He had walked with Jesus from the day Jesus began his ministry to the day of his ascension. He had learned in that time the importance of dependence. He had learned to live from God, not for God. And the question is, do we trust Jesus like that? Do we depend on God like that? Education and training and knowledge and experience, they all have their place, I suppose. But what really matters most of all? Are you walking with Jesus? Are you trusting God the Father? Are you living dependent on the Holy Spirit? Not in a religious mumbo-jumbo sort of way where you say, well, I read my Bible and I go to church and I say my blessings at each mealtime and my prayers before bed. But are you living out of the intimate relationship and love that God gives to you? Matthias had just one qualification. Maybe there were others we don't know, but there was one that mattered most of all, the only one that is mentioned in the scripture. He walked with Jesus. So his calling was, ex was ordinary, barely amounting to 15 seconds of notoriety. His qualifications seemed basic compared to the list that we put on most of the things that we ask of ourselves and others. All he had going for him was that he walked with Jesus, which we need to know is enough. But maybe, maybe what's important is to look at, his, look at his accomplishments. I mean, we know what John did. John became a mystic prayer warrior. We know that Matthew and Mark wrote scripture. We know that James led the church of Jerusalem as it went through current times of persecution. We know that Peter was a great leader and preacher. We know that all of the others are mentioned in big ways and small ways for the things that they accomplished. We hear about them in scripture and we hear about them in history. We know what they did for the kingdom of God. What of Matthias? What did he accomplish? The book of Acts says nothing about that. Not a zilch, not a thing. The New Testament doesn't even mention him again. Historical information offers nothing more as well. There's nothing about Matthias that we know except that he walked with Jesus and was selected as the 12th apostle. Now what do apostles do? Apostles are eyewitnesses. They're the ones who share what they've experienced of Jesus. All he had was the call. We know nothing more about what he did. Because evidently what he did didn't amount to something that's worth writing about in scripture or in history. And yet what he did probably made a difference in somebody's life because he was witnessing to Jesus. Matthias' story reminds me of Fred Craddock. Fred passed away recently. He was a simple, unassuming, short, short, short little man who was a preacher and a teacher and a professor. When he was younger, he always dreamed about doing something really important. Maybe he would be a martyr for Jesus on the mission field. Maybe they would build a monument to him and say, this is the place where Fred gave it all. At the time when he was a young man, $100 was a lot of money, and he thought that his ministry would be as spectacular as a $100 bill. Then ministry came. He gave lectures, he read books, he graded papers, he went to meetings, he wrote books that only preachers would read. He taught at seminary. He said he finally accepted that his call would not be the big calling when he imagined himself taking that hundred dollar bill to the bank and asking them to return it to him in quarters. And he saw the rest of his life and the rest of his ministry as living out ordinary life 
and ministry one quarter at a time. Stop grabbing for the spectacular visions. Stop doing that individually and as a congregation. God calls us generally through the humdrum of everyday life. God calls us to a ministry and service that is giving ourselves away sometimes just one quarter at a time. Dismiss the notion that you are not qualified to serve God. There's only one qualification that really matters. Have you trusted God with your life? Are you willing to walk with Jesus day by day and to trust in Him? And don't think that ministry has to be a great, big, earth-shattering kind of event. Realize that it happens in God's time, in God's way, often in barely detectable tremors, as we give our life away for the sake of the kingdom of God, one quarter at a time. Let us pray. God, you have called us all each and every one of us to the ministry of your kingdom. We pray that you will make us aware of that calling, even if it comes in barely detectable ways. We pray that you will remind us that the only qualification for ministry is that we walk with you moment by moment, day by day. And we pray that you will show us how to give our life away, even if it's just one quarter at a time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.